Okay, now today we're going to be talking about a technique with trees. All the trees are, are, are green pretty much, so we're going to talk about variations of green, how you think through mixing different greens without the painting looking boring. Really emphasizing the chances you get in a, a green summer painting to uh, get, in this case, some of the blues, blue in here, uh, the sky, the sky being very light, and it's cloudy in this image, but I would warm up that sky because it's white clouds, the sun is behind the clouds, so they're going to have a bit more of a warmth than just a cold steel gray. So using a white and yellow ochre with a little uh, purple dioxide, dioxide purple, or some kind of violet, but the violet cools it down, the, the yellow warms it up. Orange and blue would work okay, but it gets gray so fast. But ochre and a little bit of violet would work would work well. Then with this kind of, of painting, we have uh, the shapes here of the trees, you know, especially the greens. Even if it's real thin and wispy, like these aspens in here, start off with a real definite shape. Now I might vary the shape more than the photograph, create bigger areas of solid green, and then maybe a few more uh, bigger areas of sky showing through. I tend to not get the painting too spotty like it is here, just dots of leaves. You might be able to do that in an area or two around the focal point, but be careful with that. But I want bigger solid shapes, even with the evergreen trees here, more solid. Think about the pattern or the shape of the tree. You want to kind of redesign it. We're not copying what we see. We're designing a better painting, and the photograph is just a starting place. So what I've done here is I'm, I want to talk about um, negative painting, using the background to cut in and shape up the foreground. So for instance, these yellow-green aspens, and my Photoshop work here got a little goofy in that it jumps, but I got a slightly warmer sky and cut into the yellow-greens. Now it jumps up a little bit. It's hard to see the, the temperature change, but this is warmer, and you can see where I've cut into the shape. And I got rid of, if you just stare at those yellow-green leaves, I got rid of a lot of that little detail and with the sky and cut in and shaped up the greens. So in my painting, I'll start after I get the drawing down with the dark greens. Um, these aren't real dark, but they're still, you know, everything's in shadow on a cloudy day to some degree. So I'd start with the value in here, get it the shape I want. And then when I get to the sky, I cut into that shape to shape it up. Also cut into the trunks with the sky and cut into the trunks with the background blue here. The same thing with these uh, dark evergreens over here, using the sky to, there, you can see the photograph, it's more photographic looking, kind of detail oriented, the edges are. But when I cut into it, I can shape it up better. Now, I can't soften the edges here, but I really want to get into softening edges on the edges of trees. After you get the trees to this stage, coming in and softening the edges. And the key is not to get it all too soft or all real hard. I want a variety of hard and soft. That gives more of a realistic look. It shows more form where everything real hard goes flat and everything real soft kind of goes flat too. Kind of a different flatness, but it's definitely flat. Using the dark green of the evergreens here to cut into the yellow green, changing the shape and just not much, but a few darks down in here just breaks up the yellow green. I could have done more, uh, but just did a little bit just to show that. So use the negative painting, especially with trees where you can use the sky, the background mountains, background trees to really shape up the trees. Because the positive painting goes so far, then the negative kind of takes over and you can really make the shapes a lot more definite looking, a lot more refined looking. They look a lot better. They look more painterly when you can use some negative painting in there. Now the next one here, these are all in um, Wyoming around the Sheridan area, which is just a great place in the Bighorn Mountains. There's uh, cabins to stay up in there and just a beautiful place to paint. And this one has a lot of variations of or layers. We have in the foreground, probably this layer of green. Then comes this tree. And all its branches. So this is the second layer. By layer I mean this one's the foreground, this one's more in the middle ground, 
this is behind that tree, so this is kind of the third layer. And then you have a, probably that's part of the third, and then the background layer. So you can have four or five different layers of trees, and each layer is going to be a subtle color change and or value change, so that I don't want them ending up all looking the same like it does here. In general, I like fence posts, but this fence post is just way up front, way too big, and kind of takes over. So I want to mass these values together. For the foreground greens, a simple dark and light, all the layers or the successive trees as they go back will be bigger, simpler shapes than what the reference shows. So I use some different color green variation and value. And here's my, you can see I've cut out a lot of the detail. Uh, this dark, this light goes for the kind of the foreground tree. And this dark, kind of more yellow green, and this light, more yellow green, goes for also that close to the foreground. And that pulls those two trees together. And and these are all, even though this is a computer, this is my thought process is from my palette. This yellow green here is more um, cad yellow light, a little bit of blue, touch of alizarin. Or it could be cad yellow light with a little orange, which makes a yellow orange, then add a little bit of blue. But the yellow dominates. It also dominates in the shadow. So the shadow over here has more blue, but the shadow here has a bit more yellow. Because it's a yellow green in this tree, it's going to be a lighter green than this green, which is more blue. So there's a value change there and color change. This is also part of it. And then the background here, a bit more viridian. Viridian and yellow with a little bit of alizarin or cad red, something to mute it. Again, that third color is always the color that mutes it. And then the shadow is blue and viridian with a little bit of um, probably some yellow and, and red also. And then the background back in here gets really bluish green, blue with a touch of yellow orange. And that really separates it. And then a, the foreground, a stronger ultramarine blue and cad yellow. A little bit, same color back in here, just more white. Um, and the same thing with the shadow. It's uh, blue with a little bit of yellow and maybe a touch of cad red. So again, the simplicity is the main thing. If I can force all the foliage I see into bigger, simpler shapes and then separate them by layers. And uh, here it just gets, everything blends together. I really like the photograph. But if you don't separate it, something like that. You can see the blue-green really shoots back in the distance and having some negative shapes of it in here, even a little bit more, really helps it. The tree here is still the focal point, but I've punched the color in the greens, made a lot more variety in the greens as well. Starting out, blocking in these big simple shapes, uh, a little bit thinner. And by thinner, I don't mean um, a lot of paint thinner in it, a lot of medium, uh, kept some, but uh, just less on the brush and spreading it out more. The less you can add to the paint, the better. Um, a lot of people will use medium though, and it looks fine, but if you can uh, overuse it and it just makes your paint slick and too much paint thinner, it just kind of kills the color. It gets it spreads out the paint particles and just looks real weak. But I can paint thin and still have stronger paint. I got some have some paintings by some Russian artists. This one is um, Ivan Shishkin. S H I S H K I N. I really like his paintings. I like looking at them. I don't want to paint this way, but there's such a strong presence to them. Trees really have solid weight to them. And 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 even though these paintings are picky, he was part of the artist group called the Wanderers, and their I think their goal was to represent nature uh, as close as possible to what's there. And of course, there was no camera back then, or the camera was really new. So I, you know, there was a purpose for that. Then you can represent what you're seeing with paint, um, and you can get as close as you can to what you're seeing. Now we have the camera to do that. Type paintings look photographic, so they kind of lose their effectiveness. But even though his paintings are very tight, and very detail-oriented, what still pops out the first thing you, or when you see it, the first thing that pops out is the sense of light. So I don't, I'm assuming that's his goal, but uh, the value changes like the shadows on the tree trunk, 
the real strong definition of dark and light in the uh, tree branches or foliage is just so strong. Then as it goes back, things do get simpler. But for as picky as it is and more detail-oriented, the lights and shadows are very definite and very controlled. Um, so you could see where you could eliminate some of the detail here. And it would still be very, I mean, it's to be just as effective because it's not the detail that makes it work. On all his also, he has a low horizon line. His main focus, subject matter wise, is always trees. So the smaller the horizon line, the bigger the trees. If the horizon line is up here or up here, obviously then the trees are real small and they're not the focal point. But great sense of light. All of these, and I have a few of his here, have a sense of light. This is real nice. Color is very clean. It's not muddy at all. Very representational, very realistic. Um, not impressionistic. Move into it a little bit. There's a bit of a uh, painterly aspect to it, but very nice. I can really appreciate it and see it because the values are so accurate and there's still color temperature there. Not real strong color temperature, but uh, works well. But again, the overall powerful thing is the sense of light. Trees are always the biggest objects, real strong, real definite shapes, but just a beautiful sense of light there. Really nice, nice paint. And you can see where these work better as a 50 by 60 or a 100 by 130 inch painting. Now this is um, Isaac Levitan, uh, another Russian painter, I think a little later than Shishkin. A bit more impressionistic, but this is one of his color studies. This is not one of his finished paintings, which are more detailed. But you can see in his color studies or his plain air work here, big simple shapes, how he pulls these, these shapes together here into solid masses. There's not individual stuff. There's a simple dark and light. Same thing with the shadow on here, light and dark, not little stuff. And it works. And I like this because it's more brushwork oriented, where this is more uh, detail oriented. And they're both very different paintings, but they're, they're both just as important. One's not better than the other. This has a better sense of light in that he's pushing the temperature a bit more. A real cool orange here against a real bright, warm yellow orange. The muted violets, muted blues. He's pushing temperature a lot more and a lot less detail. So the temperature becomes more important. Detail is pretty much non-existent. This is another one of his right here. And this one's more detailed. The image is not as good. It gets more blurry. But a little bit different feel than uh, Shishkin in that... Uh, the brushwork is a little freer, somewhat looser, even though it's smaller and tends to be more like this. It reminds me of a Willard Metcalf, the way he applies the brushwork. But again, what the important part and what he spent three quarters of the painting achieving is these solid dark shapes in the green and light shapes, definite shape. When you squint at it, you see those shapes better. Now he breaks those shapes up, especially over in here and down in there, but um, so you can stop at any point after you've captured the light. Here the light's captured, really no detail, and you can stop or you can keep going and break it up. And it really helps to do both. I have not spent much time doing tight, uh, detailed paintings, but um, I've done a few, and it's helpful. I don't like to paint that way, but it gives me a, a better feel for where I want to stop on a painting. Maybe I can carry things a little bit further after doing a few real tight, picky things. But even on the tight, picky paintings where there's more detail, I have to spend three quarters of my time in the big shapes getting the values and temperature right.